The North American and European ecosystems are more similar than most people believe, with some aquatic, land and airborne animals being found on both continents. Some of these animals occur on both the North American and Eurasian land masses naturally, but over the years there have also been quite a few invaders. Because we humans have a destructive habit of introducing wild animals outside of their native range, there are now North American animals that are thriving in Europe, and European animals that are living their new lives in North America. In some cases, the introduced animals face little competition and only have a few threats to worry about, but some non-native animals need to fight for dominance of their new ecosystem. In today's video, I'll be taking a look at a few of these instances both in North America and in Europe, and I'll be trying to figure out which species won, or if the battle turned into a stalemate. Without further ado, we can take a look at our first battleground, and we'll start off in the forests of Northern Europe. There are many different deer species that can be found in this region, including true giants like the mighty moose. It's the largest of all living deer species, and of course it can be found on both continents. In recent years it's had to share its ecosystem with another mammal from across the pond, and this invader has been doing rather well when it comes to competing with the native deer. The white-tailed deer has a large native range across parts of both North and South America, and it's one of the most dominant deer species of the Americas. In fact, it's one of the most widely distributed land mammals in the world, and the main reason behind this is its adaptability. It can be found across a wide variety of ecosystems and habitats, and it also does very well in urban areas. It does face its fair share of predators and threats, but it still manages to survive and thrive. Today, this hardy deer isn't only found in the Americas, as it's been introduced into Europe, a few Caribbean islands and even into New Zealand. We've been introducing this species into Europe since the 1800s, but surprisingly, in a lot of cases, they were not able to establish a self-sustaining population. Like most other deer introductions around the world, they were introduced to be hunted, but famously deer are very hard to control and they don't always stay where you left them. There are a few small populations still roaming European countries today, but by far the largest population calls Finland home. The story behind the deer in this region is really quite astounding, as it's a natural miracle how they even survived in the first place. In August 1934, three bucks and four does were transported from Minnesota to Finland, and their journey took nearly four weeks and involved travelling by train and boat. By the time they arrived in Finland, only one stag and four does remained, and the survivors were quickly moved to a safer environment. They were eventually released into a three-hectare enclosure and started to recover, but initially the reproduction was very slow and some deer were lost to illness. Later on in 1938, some of the captive deer escaped from their enclosure, and following this, the rest of the deer were set free. In total, three stags and three does were now on the loose, and this population was reinforced with an additional three does and a stag in 1948. These invaders multiplied at an astonishing rate, and today the white-tailed deer population in Finland is estimated to be around 100,000. This means that the white-tailed deer in the country have a very narrow genetic pool, but despite this, they have still managed to completely take over. The white-tailed deer did face competition from the native deer, but some of the larger European deer were already scarce in the country when they arrived. Red deer are pretty much extinct in Finland, but some populations are spreading from Sweden, and even though the moose is still relatively common, they are not in the same ecological niche. Their main competition came in the form of roe deer and reindeer, but instead of battling them for limited resources and space, they seem to peacefully coexist. Reindeer, roe deer and white-tailed deer populations in Finland are all stable, and it seems as though Finland is more than capable of supporting significant numbers of large deer. Wolverines, brown bears, wolves and the Eurasian lynx are all found in the Finnish wilderness, but as they are used to dealing with most of these creatures across their native range, they find a way to mostly avoid them and thrive. So really this story is less of a battle with the native species and more of a battle against the odds, and both the non-native and native species have managed to come out on top. 
North America is home to two native swan species, the iconic trumpeter swan and the closely related tundra swan. The latter can also be found in parts of Europe, with the species being split into two subspecies. In recent years, the native swans and other waterfowl have had to deal with a large boisterous invader, and it doesn't look like it's going anywhere anytime soon. The mute swan is the heaviest swan species in the world, and it's also one of the heaviest flying birds. In most cases, when you come across these elegant birds in the wild, they will leave you be. But in the breeding season, they can become feathery balls of aggression that are looking for an excuse to attack. This is why most people give them a wide berth, and their aggression has also helped them to take over parts of North America. Mute swans were first introduced onto the continent in the mid-1800s, but the most significant introductions occurred in the early 1900s. Because they are pretty birds, the main reasons behind these introductions were so that they could be displayed in parks, but of course many of them found their way into the wild. Since their initial journey into the North American wilderness, I think it's fair to say that they are winning the battle against the native species, and they are now widely considered to be a harmful invasive species. In the Lower Great Lakes from 1971 to the year 2000, mute swans were increasing in number at an average rate of around 10% a year, and this was bad news for the native waterfowl. Because they are relatively aggressive and very large, they can easily displace native species, and because they are capable flyers, they are hard to control and monitor. They can even affect entire aquatic ecosystems by overgrazing aquatic vegetation, which many animals rely on to hide from predators. Even though the native swans and waterfowl haven't put up much of a fight, the native predators do their part, but they've been able to multiply faster than they are being preyed upon. So far, it seems as though the mute swan has won the battle for North America, but this could still change in the future. The American mink is a master of wetland and riverine habitats, and being a mustelid, it's more powerful than it appears. It's capable of taking down animals many times its own size, and it'll feed on pretty much anything it can tackle in its natural habitat. Famously, the American mink can now be found in a few different continents around the world, and the reason behind this is quite dark and cruel. The American mink and other animals with thick fur have been introduced around the world for fur farming, and the animals in these fur farms are often kept in horrible conditions. It's really abhorrent that some companies still use fur from fur farms when fake alternatives are almost indistinguishable, but thankfully some lucky animals managed to escape to a much better life in the wild. Most American mink were introduced into Europe in the 1920s and 30s, and today they can be found over large areas of the continent. This has had a massive negative effect on the native wildlife, and because the American mink is so adaptable and feeds on a wide variety of prey, it can negatively affect a large number of native animals. The animals hit the hardest are water voles and seabirds, but they do help when it comes to controlling other invaders. The American signal crayfish has completely taken over many European river systems, and the American mink is one of the few predators in the region that hunts the adult crayfish in large numbers. This positive doesn't outweigh all of the negatives of having them around, and they still manage to thrive here despite some healthy competition. Europe does have a mink species of its own, but this animal isn't exactly what it first appears to be. Even though it looks very similar to the American mink, it's actually more closely related to polecats and the Siberian weasel, and on average, it's a little smaller. This mustelid is also critically endangered partly due to the success of the American mink, so really it hasn't put up much of a fight at all. The Eurasian otter, on the other hand, is more than a match for the American mink, and in some cases, they have been known to prey on them. Aquatic habitats with healthy otter populations have fewer mink, but the American mink's size and adaptability allows them to succeed. Because the mink is smaller and requires less food to survive, it can take advantage of ecosystems that can't sustain Eurasian otters. And because they feed on more land animals and birds, they can take advantage of habitats where the otters are unable to live. 
The American mink has won this battle not by defeating the larger Eurasian otter, but instead by manoeuvring around it and taking advantage of its weaknesses. You could argue that the Canada goose needs a name change, because this bird is quite an adventurer, and today it can be found in Europe and beyond. Some Canada geese were introduced into Europe in the early 17th century, but some populations have travelled over to Europe naturally. It's rare for a non-native species to introduce itself and become established, but the animals that do this are almost always birds for obvious reasons. Today, they have a healthy population in Europe, with the UK having the largest number of birds with an estimated population of around 165,000. Because of their grazing behaviour and because they are found in large numbers, they can have negative effects on wetland ecosystems, and they compete with the native waterfowl for food and for nesting space. When the first Canada geese landed in the UK, they did face quite a lot of competition, but they soon brushed them aside and dominated the kingdom. The UK is home to a wide variety of waterfowl, including some large geese, but the Canada goose is larger than most, if not all, of these species. The UK might have been much easier to conquer than the rest of Europe due to its relatively low predator numbers and hunting pressures, and this has allowed the Canada goose to become one of the most common waterfowl species in the region. Other waterfowl species have also taken advantage of the preferable conditions such as the Egyptian goose, which can also be found in healthy numbers in some wetland areas. The winters in the UK are much milder than what they are used to across their native range, and like some other large waterfowl species such as the aforementioned mute swan, they also do very well in urban areas. So really, it was quite easy for the Canada goose to take over the UK as they have a much harder life across their native range, and it looks as though they'll be a resident here for many years to come. This final section is going to be a little shorter than usual, because I featured this story in recent videos, and it's what gave me the idea to make this video. Most of the animals that I've pitted against each other are quite similar, but the two animals in this section are so similar that they were once considered to be the same species. The Eurasian beaver and the North American beaver live very similar lives to one another, and they can be extremely hard to tell apart. They both have plenty of reasons to hate man as they were both ruthlessly hunted for their fur and their castorium, but the Eurasian beaver was once in a more dire situation. The hunting led to them being on the brink of extinction, but thankfully today they have a rapidly increasing population, and they are being reintroduced into areas where they had gone extinct. Strangely, their peril was the reason why they now battle their American cousins, and the beavers from across the pond seem to be winning. Because they were once thought to be the same species, when the Eurasian beaver was in need of saving in Europe in the 1930s, seven North American beavers were introduced into Finland. This invasion was more than successful, and they seemed to love their new life in Europe. Within 64 years, their population increased from the initial 7 to 12,000 individuals, and in 1999, it was estimated that 90% of the beavers in Finland were North American beavers. Part of the reason behind their success is the fact that Finland seems like it was made for beavers, as it has the nickname of the Land of a Thousand Lakes. This nickname is a bit of an understatement, as there are an estimated 188,000 lakes in Finland. Because the native beavers were struggling, it also made the takeover a lot easier, and their ability to utilise a variety of tree species meant that they could take advantage of most aquatic ecosystems. It's fortunate that the Eurasian beaver was able to make a comeback in other parts of Europe, because this introduction could have done a lot more harm than good by providing competition for the native beavers. It would be interesting to find out how the Eurasian beaver would fare if the roles were reversed, but the one thing that's for certain is that the North American beaver won the battle against its cousin. Of course, there are many other stories that could have featured in this video, so if you think you know of any, then let me know down in the comments below. But for now, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.